I really don't think I'm going to critique Jordan Peterson that much because Jordan Peterson's really only made one point and he hammered that point hard to William Lane Craig. And the point was that you don't need this sense, this, you don't need this idea of eternity to have meaning. And I think he did a very good job at doing that. The styles, the presentation styles between William Lane Craig and Jordan Peterson is just worlds apart. Jordan Peterson has a, he is just way more experienced at engaging people, meeting people where they're at, uh, helping them feel his points and rather just thinking about his points. Whereas William Lane Craig is standing rigid behind a podium reading from his notes Jordan Peterson is walking across the stage, engaging the audience, looking into their eyes. What I want you to remember is whenever William Lane Craig, in this forum, in this video uh, that I'm critiquing right now, hosted by Whitecliffe College of Toronto, whenever you hear William Lane Craig use the words objective, ultimate, or even the word really, what William Lane Craig means by these words is this concept of his God. First, if God does not exist, there is no ultimate purpose of life. Let's replace the word ultimate with God and see what that sounds like. If God does not exist, there is no God purpose of life. That seems pretty reasonable to me. If death stands with open arms at the end of life's trail, then what is the goal of life? Is it all for nothing? Is there no reason for life? Jordan Peterson uh, really closed the door on this idea that if, uh, if the ending is death, then therefore there's no meaning. Uh, I'll just throw in uh, another example. If you know, once the fourth quarter of a Super Bowl is done, does that mean that the Super Bowl was meaningless? Is there no reason to watch the Super Bowl if it ends? Is it utterly pointless? If its destiny is a cold grave in the recesses of outer space, the answer must be yes. It is pointless. There is no goal, no purpose for the universe. The litter of a dead universe will just go on expanding and expanding forever. Hey, what about heaven? Is it utterly pointless if the destiny of heaven is not changing? The answer must be yes. It is pointless if there's no goal, no purpose for heaven, because there's nothing beyond it. It will just go on forever and ever and ever. What of mankind? Is there no purpose at all for the human race? Or will it simply peter out someday, lost in the oblivion of an indifferent universe? Yes, uh, Craig, this could be true. But I'm really curious why this bothers you so much. Uh, why does this give you so much despair and not for others? Is there some type of psychological need that you have that maybe some other people don't? I don't know. Um, and we are talking about billions of years in the future before our sun envelops our planet. That's a long time away. I, I, don't, I can't even conceptualize that amount of time. So I'm curious why this affects you so much more than it affects me. Second, if God does not exist, there is no ultimate value in life. Uh, substitute the word God for ultimate, and let's uh, see what he just said. Second, if God does not exist, there is no God value in life. Well, again, that's just the tautology. He's just, he's really not saying anything meaningful here. If there is no God, then there are no objective standards of good and evil, right and wrong. Okay, if there is no God, then there is no God standards of good and evil, right and wrong. I agree. Uh, I agree. It, it, it makes perfect sense, but I don't think you've said anything meaningful. By objective standards, I mean moral standards which are valid and binding independently of human opinion. If God does not exist, then there is no transcendent source of moral values. Rather, moral values are either just the byproducts of sociobiological evolution and conditioning, or else 
expressions of personal taste. And if a god does exist, then objective moral standards are just the byproduct of his nature and just expressions of, of his personal tastes. In a world without God, there can be no objective right and wrong, only our culturally and personally relative subjective judgments. <sighs> Bill is saying that in a world without God, there can be no God right or wrong. If God exists, then there's only God's personally arbitrary nature or subjective commands. Any specific action that we may deem reprehensible could actually be good if this God sanctions it. So, who's to say whose values are right and whose are wrong? Who's to judge that one person's values are inferior to those of another? And who's to say, Bill, that your God's nature is right or wrong? Can you judge the nature of Yahweh as right or wrong, Bill? I think you have to say no. I think you forfeited that right to judge your God as right or wrong. The concept of objective morality loses all meaning in a universe without God. Yes, the concept of God morality loses all meaning in a universe without God. I don't... Christians, do you see just how absolutely ridiculous this is? All we are confronted with is, in Jean-Paul Sartre's words, the bare, valueless fact of existence. That means that it is impossible to condemn war, oppression, or bigotry as evil. Well, it's very possible for me to condemn war, oppression, or bigotry. In fact, I can condemn these things in more cases than you, Bill, since you would have to support war, oppression, and bigotry in cases where your God sanctions it or commands it. Nor can you praise tolerance, equality, and love as good. For in a universe without God, good and evil do not exist. There is only the bare, valueless fact of existence, and there is no one to say that you are right and I am wrong. Uh, in a universe, Bill, where your God exists, uh, what you see as good, Bill, might actually be evil. And what you see as an evil action, Bill, might actually be good, depending on the divine command or will of your God. You're not omniscient, Bill, so uh, you don't know exactly what God wants, what he desires. You might have an idea based on what you think is your holy book and what your God has said in that holy book. But again, I think you have forfeited the thinking part of morality when you basically say, ah, no, it's all just because of this God. It's basically what the boss says. Third, if there is no God, then there is no ultimate significance to life. Now, how I, I've said this many times, how ridiculous is this statement when you actually just put in God for the word ultimate? Third, if there is no God, then there's no God significance to life. Not very powerful, is it, when you put it that way? If each individual person passes out of existence when he dies, then what ultimate importance can be given to his life? What if a God exists, Bill, and yet there's no heaven or hell? Have you ever considered that possibility? I know you, you believe your Bible, but if we're just, as a philosopher, I think you appreciate thought experiments. Here's a thought experiment. God exists, full stop. There's no eternal life, full stop. Does that mean now that we can have a God existing and that there's no significance to people's lives? How do you combine that God concept with eternity concept? Does it necessarily have to be tied together? Does it really matter whether he ever existed at all? No, certainly his life may be important relative to certain other events, but what is the ultimate significance of any of those events? If everything is doomed to destruction, then what does it matter that you influenced anything? Ultimately, it makes no difference. 
the con he sounds like Ken Ham right here. Contributions of the scientists to the advance of human knowledge, the researches of the doctor to alleviate pain and suffering, the efforts of the diplomat to secure peace in the world, the sacrifices of good people everywhere to better the lot of the human race. In the end, they don't make one bit of difference. They all come to nothing. <sighs> What does it really matter? What does it really matter if scientists make advancements in medicine that could save the life of, let's say, a young girl dying of um, bone cancer? What does it matter, Bill? What does it matter that doctors can reduce the pain and suffering in this girl who's suffering from bone cancer? Here's a challenge for you, Bill. What you just said, I dare you. I double dare you to say this to an atheist couple, parents of a child who's dying of bone cancer or leukemia. I can't imagine you would ever talk this way in real life. It's sickening. Do you understand the gravity of the alternatives before us? If God exists, then there is hope for man. If God does not exist, then all we are left with is despair. I would have to disagree with you, Bill. God is not necessary for hope. God is only necessary for ultimate hope, which, as we see, is re really means God hope. But if God is dead, then man is dead, too. Unfortunately, most people do not realize this fact. They continue on as though nothing had changed. Most people continue on like nothing has changed if God is dead. Are you admitting that some non-Christians are doing just fine, Bill, without the belief in your God? Uh, if that's the case, maybe you shouldn't tell them that they should be in despair. Just let them stay in their ignorance. Do you want them to have this angst and despair that you have if it's not true that your God exists? Do you desire people to have this deep psychological need that you have? Confronted with the human predicament about the only solution the atheist can offer is that we simply face the absurdity of life and live bravely. Okay, this is the first time that he's mentioned the word atheist. But Bill, I'm curious, why are you using the word atheist here? Shouldn't you be using the term non-Christian? Don't you believe that Hindus face the same absurdity as atheists do? Or are you saying, Bill, that you can have meaning in life as long as you choose any god? That any god will do? I don't think you're saying this, Bill. I think you're saying that you can only have this ultimate meaning from your god. And thus the topic of a meaning is is not between the theist and atheist, but the Christian and everybody else. I think, Christians, if you're listening to this, you're agreeing with me here. But why is Bill picking atheism out? I think I know why. The fundamental problem with this solution, however, is that it's impossible to live consistently and happily within the framework of such a worldview. If you live consistently, you will not be happy. If you live happily, it is only because you are not consistent. Okay, Bill. So if Muslims and Jews and Hindus and Buddhists, uh, if they're happy, they're not consistent? And if they're consistent, then they're not happy? The human predicament is thus truly terrible. The atheistic worldview is insufficient to maintain a happy and consistent life. Man cannot live consistently and happily as though life were ultimately without purpose, value, or significance. Bill, let me help you here. I think what you mean to say is that any worldview other than yours is insufficient to maintain happy and consistent lives. Or is it possible for you to admit that someone can believe something false and have a consistent and happy life. I don't think you're saying that. 
If we try to live consistently within the framework of the atheistic worldview, we shall find ourselves profoundly unhappy. And if you live consistently within the framework of Mormonism, shall we find ourselves profoundly unhappy? And by the way, uh, what is an atheistic worldview? Calling oneself an atheist doesn't say much, if anything, about their worldview other than they don't believe in a god. Who knows? There might be atheists out there who believe in some type of eternal life and still don't believe in a god. If instead we manage to live happily, it is only by giving the lie to our worldview. Atheism, therefore, cannot support a happy and consistent life. I'm curious, Bill, if an atheist or a non-Christian can be happy by lying to themselves, how do you know, Bill, you haven't done the same thing? According to the biblical worldview, God does exist, and life does not end at the grave. God has created us for a purpose, to know him and enjoy him forever. Why do you want to live forever? Uh, I don't understand that. I think that concept of living forever and ever might lead to despair as well. God himself, who transcends socially relative mores, is the objective standard of moral principles and goodness, and his commandments are the source of our objective moral duties. Bill, why are God's commandments your source for objective moral duties? Why should someone obey your God? Just because he says so? Is it because your God has some special foreknowledge that he can perfectly give to humans that leads them to make the right choices? And if true, do we see evidence of Christians making better choices than non-Christians around the world? Or is it more so, Bill, that you're scared that if you don't do what this God says, that he somehow might become unhappy with you, sad with you. Because we shall live forever, the decisions and actions we take in this life are imbued with an eternal significance that lasts beyond the grave. Oh, wow. So that it, the choices you make have eternal consequence uh, or eternal significance that lasts beyond the grave. I don't think you really believe this, Bill. Don't you believe a person can make wrong choices their whole life? In fact, really bad choices like rape, murder, torture, their whole life, and then sincerely repent and call upon Jesus and believe on Jesus. And then aren't all those actions covered in the blood of Jesus? Biblical theism therefore provides the two conditions necessary for a purposeful, valuable, and meaningful life. God and immortality. Because of this, we can live consistently and happily within the framework of such a worldview. Thus, biblical theism succeeds precisely where atheism breaks down. And where Mormonism, Hinduism, Taoism, Islam breaks down. Or is it possible to have false theistic beliefs and still have ultimate meaning and purpose? Now, I would be the first to say that none of this proves that God exists. Even if atheism is unlivable, it may still be true. And even if Hinduism is unlivable, it still may be true. Right, Bill? But in tonight's dialogue, we've not been asked to discuss whether God exists or not. I've written extensively on that question elsewhere. Tonight, we've been asked to discuss, is there meaning to life. On this score, there need be no dispute between the theist and the atheist. Indeed, it has been the atheists themselves, as we have seen, who have given the mo most poignant analyses of the human predicament. Let them speak for themselves. Without God, they tell us, life becomes absurd, for it is without ultimate purpose, value, or significance. Well, uh, not all atheists speak for me, just like not all Christians speak for you, Bill. And I'm not sure what you mean by absurd in this context. But I personally don't say, as an atheist, that, um, that my life becomes absurd without the belief in God. 
And since you say there's no dispute between the atheist and theist about atheism being absurd, are you also saying that there's no theistic beliefs that are absurd? Isn't this a false dichotomy, Bill? Atheism versus theism, when really you mean Christianity versus non-Christianity. Please be honest here, Bill. I think that's what you're doing and what you're meaning. You're bringing up atheism because you realize that atheism or non-religion in general is what's taking away most of the youth within Christianity. And this is what's scaring you. It's making you sad. And if Christians, if it were true that only Christians who left Christianity became Hindus, my guess is we'd be talking about Hinduism here instead of atheism. I agree. <laughs> Thank you. But I would add one thing. We've seen that if God does not exist, then life is futile. If God does exist, then life is meaningful. Only the second of these two alternatives enables us to live consistently and happily. Therefore, it seems to me that even if the evidence for these two options were absolutely equal, a rational person ought to choose theism. Hmm. A rational person ought to choose theism. Well, you heard it here first. Bill believes it's more rational to choose theism over atheism. Let's think about this. There's many different types of theisms out there <laughs> or forms of theism. Bill, are you saying it's more rational to choose Mormonism over atheism? Bill, is, are you saying it's more rational to worship a monkey god than be an atheist? Bill, are you saying that it's more rational to be a Muslim and believe that you're going to have 72 virgins after you die than be an atheist? You might be right in that case. That is to say, if the evidence is equal, it seems to me positively irrational to prefer death, futility, and despair to life, meaningfulness, and happiness. Therefore, my advice is go with God. As Pascal said, we have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Oh, my. Go with Allah. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Go with Vishnu. You have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Bill, you've been around Christian apologetics for so long that you're completely oblivious to your own cocoon that you've wrapped yourself in. Bill, if you are wrong, you also have everything to lose, even within the context of theism. If the Orthodox Jews are correct, and if you worship Jesus as God, you are an adulterer, and you are committing one of the worst sins ever, and you might be suffering in the pits of hell forever and ever and ever and ever, Bill. Think about that. But to use Pascal's wager here at the end, don't you see you've just contradicted everything you just said? You said there can be no ultimate meaning and purpose without God. And then you're saying, but even if there is no God, you should believe it anyhow, because you have nothing to lose and everything to gain. By saying this, you're admitting that it's the belief that gives meaning and not necessarily the reality or the ontology behind it. Well, you know, that symphony is going to end. What makes you think it has any meaning at all? It's like, well, how do you respond to something like that? You say, you should reconsider the way you're looking at the world there, buddy.